lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through, light us through and through with thy everlasting shining presence. Om Amen. So, Cindy, if you would be good enough to read us okay. about St. Catherine of Siena. Okay. Oh, hello, Beverly. So good to see you. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, here we go. Um, St. Catherine of Siena. If I did not understand the glory and sufferings of the human heart, I would not speak before its holiness. That's the quote at the beginning of her bio. St. Catherine, 1347 to 1380, was said to have been profoundly interested in every human being that ever came before her. She devoted herself to relieving the mental and emotional suffering of the hundreds who sought her out. Her words and her touch bestowed a soothing grace. Strange, she once said, that so much suffering is caused because of the misunderstanding of God's true nature. God's heart is more gentle than the virgin's first kiss upon the Christ. And God's forgiveness to all, to any thought or act, is more certain than our own being. Catherine ben Benincasa, Benincasa, Benin, Benincasa was born March 25th, 1347 in the Fontebranda district of Siena, Italy. She and her twin sister, who died soon after birth, were two of more than 20 children born to parents who were devout Catholics. It was a time of class feuds and religious wars, as well as the Black Plague and famine in Siena. It was the time of transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. One day when Catherine was six years old, she and her brother were returning from her older sister's house. As they neared the church of the Dominican friars, set upon the beautiful hill of Camporegi, Catherine looked up above the church and saw in the sunset Jesus and three of his apostles. Jesus smiled at her and raised his hand in a blessing. Catherine became happy beyond any delight she had ever known. She became transfixed by this vision and it took her brothers tugging at her arm to bring her back into this world. She was transformed by this experience and began devoting her life to finding God through solitude, fasting, and prayer. When Catherine was seven years old, her longing to wed God became so intense she left home alone to find a cave in the forest of Lecto, where a known settlement of hermits was said to, to live. Taking with her only a loaf of bread, she soon found herself in the enchanting hillside forest. To her great surprise and delight, she discovered a cave that she thought was a perfect place in which to spend her life seeking God. Remember, she's seven years old. <laughs> During the night, while in prayer, Catherine felt a great uneasiness come over her body and her <clears throat> limbs became numb. Feeling a little frightened, suddenly she heard a divine voice say, how brave you are, my child. 
but let our wedding be later. The next thing Catherine knew, she was at home in her own bed. No one had missed her and she was absolutely sure that what had happened was not a dream. The next day, she took her brother to the cave and asked him to go inside and see if anything was there. He returned carrying two sticks Catherine had bound together in a little cross with part of the hem torn from her dress and also the uneaten loaf of bread. She had leaned this cross upright against the east wall and had also placed the bread there, intending to fast as long as she could. On seeing these, Catherine fell upon her knees with deep thanks and happiness and a faith in God. As she became older, she resisted her parents' pressure to marry and became a Dominican nun. At 21, she returned to her family to begin a life of active service to the infirm and destitute while maintaining a deep interior life of contemplation. Jesus appeared to her many times, sometimes performing miracles and nourishing her deep love for him. She was a diplomat and people from all walks of life sought her counsel. St. Catherine died at the age of 33. She was a rare, fearless human being whose faith in God turned into tangible experiences with the divine. Although she thought of herself as uneducated, her book, The Dialogue, and her other writings are highly valued by theologians. She had no official appointment, yet it is clear she served at the church as she yet it is clear she served as the church's conscience. In 1970, Pope Paul VI proclaimed her a doctor of the church. For those of you who don't know, Doctor of the Church is one of the highest honors that can be given to a saint um, and is in recognition of the fact that they, that person <clears throat> um, made a difference in how the church did things. Bart, is there anything you want to add to that about Doctor of the Church? Oh, I thought he was with us. Oh, he, he might have stepped away from his computer or something. Yeah, he might have. All right. There he is. Bart? Uh, St. Catherine. St. Catherine was uh, named the doctor, doctor of the church. Yes. Church. Uh, I, I said a little bit about that to, to the limit of my knowledge. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add about the honor that Pope Paul VI gave her when he named her a doctor of the church? What was it that he was saying about her? Um, maybe I could. I, I apologize, everyone. I had to step, step away for a moment. Um, let me... Let me Google some things and get back to you. I believe there are a total of maybe 30 doctors of the church. Oh, and that's, only... all right. that's all right, Bart. You don't need to do any research about you... it. I just wondered if there was anything you wanted to, to add yeah. just from your personal knowledge. I I, yeah. I, I said a, a few words about it, uh, that it was one uh, of the highest honors that a saint could be given. It is. And, it is. Uh, it's, the reason it's in recognition of the fact that that individual made a real difference in how the church did things. Mm -hmm. They healed the church from, as a doctor does, they healed the church from um, illness. 
mm-hmm. and, uh, and improved its uh, <coughs> improved its uh, way of being. Mm-hmm. I would just I would just say that most you know the the church is very patriarchal and the lineage of Christ's teachings always come from men in that way and she passed she passed away in 1380 and it took the church a very long time to catch up with her in terms of mysticism and putting the the legalistic ideas about um about doctrine and dogma to put that to the side and, and begin to absorb where she was coming from same right. same thing with t- saint thomas aquinas in, is taking us 1970 it says here in yeah 70s in 1970 pope paul was, uh-huh. anyway we don't we don't need to go on a lot more about right. it um but thank you very much for your contribution yes sure <clears throat> ima would you like to read for us consumed in grace Sure, Brother Shakra, I will. Consumed in grace. I first saw God when I was a child, six years of age. The cheeks of the sun were pale before him, and the earth acted as a shy girl like me. Divine light entered my heart from his love that did never fully wane. Though indeed, dear, I can understand how a person's faith can at times flicker. For what, for what is the mind to do with something that becomes the mind's ruin, a God that consumes us in his grace? I have seen what to want. It is there, the beloved of infinite tenderness. Consumed in grace. I first saw God when I was a child, six years of age. The cheeks of the sun were pale before him and the earth acted as a shy girl like me. I'm light entered my heart from his love that did never fully wane. Though indeed, dear, I can understand how a person's faith can at times flicker. For what is the mind to do with something that becomes the mind's ruin? A God that consumes us in his grace. I've seen what you want. It is there, a beloved of infinite tenderness. Beautiful poem, Brother Shankra. Yes, indeed. It's beautiful. <clears throat> Is there anything anyone would like to say about it? It seems this is her first experience of God when she was little going near the mountain, I think. Six years old, yes. She was coming back from, from her older brother or sister's house i forget which she was with her brother one of her the brother that she was closest to in and closest yeah. to an age and she had this experience of seeing god above the church of the dominican friars and this is her uh, description of that it seems like she's a born mystic brother shankara well at six years you know, from 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 the point of view of uh, the east <clears throat> where reincarnation is believed in yeah um it certainly uh, makes perfect sense that she would awaken so early if mm. she had and uh, you know she clearly was not she was in a cycle where she was leaving the body very early she left yeah. the body at 33 when she was in this in this incarnation but uh, anything else that anyone would like to say about the poem itself? (coughs) 
Well, let me just say, if you remember the quote that started this, you know, that was before her little biography, if she did not understand the glory and the suffering of the human heart, she would not speak before its holiness, which says a lot all by itself. But this stanza really catches my attention. Divine light entered my heart from his love that did never fully wane, though indeed, dear, I can understand how a person's faith can at times flicker. For what is the mind, notice what she's speaking of, what, no, for what is the mind to do with something that brings, that becomes the mind's ruin? A God that consumes us, the mind, in his grace. And, and uh, so there she is, this understanding of the suffering of the human being. Because as we've read from other saints and, and we know from our own experience, we resist this experience of being consumed by God. <clears throat> we, Saint uh, Teresa of Avila says that she shamed herself away from this experience. Uh, and then when she tried to do that again, God just overwhelmed her and said, no, I insist. And um, so by shaming herself away from it, she, she said, St. Teresa said, oh, I'm not worthy of that. So <laughs> what is the mind to do with something that becomes the mind's ruin? a God that consumes us in his grace. So it, that explains a lot of our, the dance we do with the world. <laughs> our willingness to be distracted. Anything else, dears? She also said in her first paragraph, Brother Shankara, strange that so much suffering is caused because of the misunderstanding of God's true nature. That is so very true in this world. Oh, even, yeah. today, even today, it is so true, so true. Oh, yes, and, and, and I think you're right. It is ever thus. It has exactly. nothing to do with todayness or yesterdayness, or it's just ever so. Yes, under the name of God, so many things are happening. Horrible stuff is happening. Not able to understand God's true nature, the unconditional love and forgiveness. Well, you know, she expresses it as a tenderness that is more tender exactly. than the virgin's first kiss upon the yes. Christ. Yes, thank you. You're right. Anything else from anyone about this one? Well, it's, it's yes, please. Um, it's interesting to me, not just this example, but, um, you know, somebody so long ago who had this sort of experience and was known in the Catholic Church, at least, and says things like this and says, I have seen what you want. It is there a beloved of infinite tenderness that this sort of experience was known and even respected. And yet the church and the churches and the religions and all this continue to, you know, play this game with, most human beings and and tell them 
you know, no, God is, is vengeful and, and will punish you and fling you into hell and all this stuff. And it's just, it's just remarkable to me. You, and it's going on today. <laughs> it's going on today. But at the same time, things like this are more becoming not so just some, some musty book on somebody's lost shelf. You know, we're, we're hearing the stuff. And even those of us who aren't reading these things exactly, there are, there are religious people and pastors and ministers and priests and monks and nuns who are without even knowing that this stuff, they know this stuff. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And that's heartening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cynthia Bourgeau, for example. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of someone outside the patriarchy. Yeah. She's good. Cynthia Bourgeau is a great spokeswoman for this view, this vision of the divine presence that is all loving, all forgiving, and a beloved of infinite tenderness now if, if we if she says infinite limitless unending so nothing is as you use the word unconditional cindy you know nothing could take from that nothing could be a barrier to it and to say that it is infinite is to say is a word and is like it's it's the uh tenderness that passes all understanding <laughs> yes exactly. we, can, we can't even imagine but we can try um well, one of the best ways for us to imagine and to try, as you say, is to just ride along with these saints and believe what they say. Anyone else have a mumbling word to say about this one? Okay, let us pass on to the next one. live without thought of dying. Bart, are you feeling like reading something? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, live Thank you. Live without thought of dying. Mm -hmm. Live without thought of dying. We work so hard to fly and no matter what heights we reach, our wings get folded near a candle at the end. For nothing can enter God but himself. Our souls are some glorious substance of the divine that no sentry wants to stop. Live without thought of dying, for dying is not a truth. We have swayed on the sky's limb together. Many years there, the same leaves grow. But then they get that look in their eyes and bid farewell to what they disdained or cherished. This life, he gave the shell, the daily struggles we know. Sit quiet for a, for a minute, dear. Feel the wind. Let light touch you. Live without thought of dying, for dying is not a truth. And again, live without thought of dying. We work so hard to fly, and no matter what heights we reach, our wings get folded near a candle at the end, for nothing can enter God but himself. Our souls are some glorious substance of the divine that no century wants to stop. Live without thought of dying. 
for dying is not a truth. We have swayed on the sky's limb together many years. There the same leaves grow. But then they get that look in their eyes and bid farewell to what they disdained or cherished. This life he gave this shell, the daily struggles we know. Sit quiet for a minute, dear. Feel the wind. Let light touch you. Live without thought of dying, because die, for dying is not a truth. Amen. Thank you, Bert. Thank you for a very Thank good you. reading. I love the I love the part about where we we read in in the Gita. Our we have our uh, gosh achieve achieve the state of non-attachment mm -hmm. and how she addresses the very same thing where we bid farewell to the things that we disdained or cherished mm -hmm. and that we are just we're refined we're the substance of god of the of the godhead mm -hmm. anyway i'll the divine presence, the divine substance. Anyone else have anything to say about this meditation on what it means to be alive and the... I like that. I like this part, Brother Shankara. Sit quiet for a minute, dear. Feel the wind. Let light touch you. That is, unless we sit quietly, we cannot let the light touch us. Real wisdom. Well, the, as, as, as said by her elsewhere and by others, exactly, it's always, it's always touching us. We don't, unless we sit quiet, we don't notice. Exactly. We won't even acknowledge it. We just don't even realize that it's touching us unless we sit quietly in meditation. You are truly correct. Yes. Thank you so much. And she's just on the line with every other mystic in the world. Seems as if. Isn't she? I love this image. We work so hard to fly. Yes. And no matter what heights we reach, our wings get folded near a candle at the end. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Anyone else? What do you suppose? Somebody please address uh, from their own thoughts, their own feelings, what it means that we, <coughs> our souls are some glorious substance of the divine that no sentry wants to stop. What is she talking about? I sort of feel like um, the sentry, no sentry, is uh, this thing about, well, I'm thinking about death anyway, because I witnessed the death of a little cat today, not my cat, somebody's cat. And I mean, it was, it was very sad in one respect. But at the same time, the animal didn't suffer at all. And I really felt like it was free. And that like, oh, it was okay. <laughs> it was okay with it. Uh, I wasn't, but, um, but it's like the century, let me go back to that. Where is it? Oh. That no century wants to stop that in death it's like the century that guards our lives 
um, our own guardedness of our own lives and especially those of our loved ones, be they people or critters or whatever. Does it isn't going to stop going to this glorious, beautiful, so much better than being contained in a, in a body sort of existence. I, I may be rambling, but <clears throat> no, that's that's <clears throat> well, one of the centuries we know about from the Christian church perspective is Saint Peter, Saint Peter at the Golden Gate says you can go in you got to go down there she's saying that just isn't the case that just there is no sentry like that there may be some being who directs us but not to a hell not to uh, they may direct us to where our next appropriate abode will be but they are not going to stop us <coughs> as she said in the she previous said. poem infinite tenderness infinite tenderness infinite forgiveness and love and you know uh, she lived in a time of the plague so many people were dying it's very like what's happening now but it was a more horrible death in a way <clears throat> in part because there was so little medicine to to treat anything the Black Plague was a horrible way to die. So live without thought of dying. I mean, it must have been on people's minds constantly. Many years the same leaves grow. And then this lovely line, but then they get that look in their eyes and bid farewell to what they disdained or cherished. This life he gave the shell, the body, the mind. This life he gave the, the shell. The daily struggles of that shell, we know. And then she says, as Haima remarked on this very powerful, sit quiet for a minute, dear. She addresses us as dear. Sit quiet for a moment, dear. Feel the wind. Let light touch you, capital L, light. There's some, some chat popped on. I, I, what did it say? I want it. It's Bart. Everyone, I saw a, a an interview about a near death experience last night, and it just really ties in with what we're reading, and especially this poem. I wanted to share that link with you, uh -huh. okay. with you all. So, anyway, because I won't be able to pick it up from here, would you email it to me, please? I've Bart? I've got it. I, I went. Oh, ahead certainly. I went ahead and pulled up the video, so I can just send it to you, Sean, for I'll just send you the link. Okay, very good. Yeah, it, the name is Jane Thompson. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Where is that? Oh, yeah. So this next one is short. I'll I'll read it. And, and
well, I'll, I'll say it after I read. Vulnerable. Vulnerable we are, like an infant. We need each other's care, or we will suffer. Vulnerable. Vulnerable we are, like an infant. We need each other's care, or we will suffer. And th this, this just touches me. Vulnerability. Most of us are so reluctant to own up to our vulnerability and own up to how much we need one another. That's one of the reasons I, I love these gatherings is because we are here together to share and in, in our joy and in our sorrow and in our love and dependence on one another. Vulnerable. Vulnerable we are like an infant. We need each other's care, or we will suffer. So the implication is, if we offer one another, if we offer one another, the recognition of this vulnerability, and we offer one another <clears throat> this loving care, there will be less suffering. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. You just took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say that this Zoom itself is, it's, uh, it's so soothing for every day, five days a week. It's been wonderful to get through this pandemic with all our company and care you know, money can't buy this caring from each other. You right. know, money can buy things, but not the love and care. Right. It's just, uh, this Zoom has been such a blessing this whole year, one year almost. We finished one year with the Zoom and uh, we definitely needed this, uh, this congregational care with one another. How, what a blessing. Thank you so much. Wow. And this this poem is so touching, so touching and so true. Yeah, I'm mindful of the Beatles song from, from what you just said. I'm mindful of the Beatles song, Can't Buy Me Love. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Money can buy me diamond rings, but money can't yes. buy me love. That's right, that's right. <clears throat> And I would, else? Yeah, yes, Heidi. I would just add to, I think that's one of the reasons that why we are all on this planet is to help each other. Yes. Yes, truly. Um, so, you know, I think it makes our uh, joyous moments more joyous and our painful moments less painful when we share them with others. Amen, sister. Amen. And I've noticed, Heidi, that those aren't just words for you, that you live that. And that <laughs> it's, it's, it's beautiful. I'd just like to say that the reason I was able to get my COVID vaccinations earlier than I might have otherwise gotten them was because Heidi was being very alert to where these vaccinations were being offered. And as soon as she became aware that CVS had some opportunities, she let Elizabeth Yates, who lives here with me, not in the monastery, but in the visitor's residence, uh, she let Elizabeth know. And Elizabeth was able to immediately get on. And in, in, in no time, uh, I had my first vaccination and then in the appropriate length of time, the other. And it was because of Heidi's caring. So thank you, Heidi, for 
having that be a reality for you that you live from day well, to day. You're very welcome. And I'm so grateful that worked out for you. It also benefited me and my husband. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there was a whole, a small group of people on the next door blog or message board. I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with that next door. They were just rapid fire sending out links in real time of locations and, you know, near and far. And I just subscribed to that. So, you know, again, it was like, I was just one branch of that tree, you know, as they say, uh, where other people were feeding the information, but, but that's how it hap That's how it works, you know? Yes. And it is something not to just be thought about. Mm -hmm. We, we need each other's care. And so when that becomes a reality for us from day to day, what a difference it makes. And this is, this is a little, this is like a homily from, from her, from St. Catherine. And again, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard for most people to admit that they're vulnerable, allow themselves to be vulnerable in the presence of others. And, uh, and say, yes, without you, I suffer. Anything else about this lovely little poem? <clears throat> so essentially everybody is vulnerable whether they know it or not. That's what she's saying and I certainly agree with it myself, Aaron. Everyone is vulnerable. And whether they acknowledge it or not. They know it whether they acknowledge it or not. They may not acknowledge it even much to themselves, let alone to others, because it, it can be characterized as weakness, but it's not weakness. That's why she says, like an infant. Hmm? Like an infant. There's no question that an infant is vulnerable. <clears throat> they can't do anything for themselves, really. <clears throat> it isn't that we shouldn't do for ourselves. It's just that we should not acknowledge this need for one another and do what we can, as, as Heidi was pointing out. You know, she was just part of a part of a process, but she was an active part of the process, not an observer, not just a passive part. <clears throat> Who wants to read? I won't take no for an answer. So I am you feeling like reading? Sure. Sorry, I joined a little late today. Something. Oh, well, happened. shame on you. And <laughs> I know I do feel bad because I missed oh, that. Oh, don't feel bad. <laughs> I missed that uh, two nice points, I think. But uh, I will read this one. I won't take no for an answer. I <clears throat> won't take no for an answer. God began to say to me, when he opened his arms each night wanting us to dance. I won't take no for an answer. I won't take no for an answer, God began to say to me, when he opened his arms each night wanting us to dance. Again, such a um, 
encouraging poem. Yes. Um, and as Haima pointed out earlier, the only way we'll ever get to that place where we know that God wants us to dance is by being quiet. And you'll notice she mentions each night. It's good to be quiet at night. A dear friend once said to me that this, this, uh, this relationship that we have with God can sometimes seem like a like the moves of a square dance, and and uh, it's a, it's a do si do. For those of you who know square dancing, you know that do si do is you hold hands and you come together and then apart and then come together and apart, come together and apart three times. That's a do si do. Um, So yes, uh, and and when that uh, was first said to me, I just laughed out loud because yes, that's exactly it. And also, it's nice to know that he will not take no for an answer, so we don't have any <laughs> excuse not to join him. <laughs> exactly, and 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 is endlessly patient. And until until our attention uh, is there to uh, to see, and it's interesting, isn't it? If we just go back and think about these saints, how much they use dance, dancing with God. You know, in my sweet crushed angel, Afi says, you waltzed magnificently, my dear. Mm. <laughs> so this, and we were on his jeweled dance floor. And Ra Rabia uh, talks about dancing also. Rumi, I'm sure does, I just don't remember a poem. I won't take no for an answer, God began to say to me. <laughs> oh, yes, okay. As, as you said, Swayam, it's reassuring. It's sweet. Anybody else got anything to say about it? Notice Brother Shankar. Yes. Even even uh, Nietzsche said that I can't believe in a God who doesn't dance. Yes. If you think about all the mystics and saints we're reading, and then maybe at the other end of our spectrum, even Nietzsche claims that God is a lover of dance and embraces us to dance. Yes. Notice notice that at first. She was saying no. And he says, I won't take no for an answer when he opened his arms each night wanting us to dance. Yes, uh, for those of you who know anything at all about the, the Jewish community, particularly the Yiddish people, dancing is absolutely just a part of their spiritual celebration. Ava Nagila, Ava Nagila, Ava Nagila, Veles Macha.
Katrina, have you got the book open there? She must have stepped away. Aaron, have you got the book open? Uh, no, I have it, but it's not open. Okay. Uh, I don't know what. All right. Uh, Liam, have you got the book open? You feel like reading? Uh, I don't have it uh, open, although I could open it. Okay. Or, <laughs> Uh, Aaron, if you want to grab the book, it's page 187. Okay, uh, I got it. Okay. So read, they kiss sometimes. If you wish. Okay. They kiss sometimes when no one is looking. The sun and the moon. Why are they so shy before us? Haven't we all seen someone making love? I wept once for three days because he would not touch me. For, for is it not a bride's right to know him? I have seen what I want in heaven's shop. Crazed I have become for this. He was sitting in the window one day, my Lord, when I walked through the, the sky's streets. Read more slowly you. if you would. Aaron, please. And they kiss again, sometimes. Please. They kiss sometimes when no one is looking. The sun and the moon. Why are they so shy before us? Haven't we all seen someone making love? I wept once for, for three days because he would not touch me. <clears throat> for is it not a bride's right to know him? I have seen what I want in heaven's shop. Crazed I have become for this. He was sitting in a window one day, my Lord, when I walked through the sky's streets. He was sitting in a window one day, my Lord, when I walked through the sky's streets. Sitting there like something buy from a shop. I have become crazed for this. <clears throat> Notice how she speaks so vulnerably. Anybody else have anything they want to say about this? I like the imagery of the the sun and the moon. It's oh, an interesting, yes. interesting way of uh, painting painting these pictures or the picture she's and and the divine in the person of Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita says that he is the sun and then this wonderful line that I've loved ever since I first read it and among the stars of night I am the moon so he is both the nurturing and life-giving being the sun and its reflection and its reflection. <laughs> Anybody else have something to say about it? The passion and the bliss that all these poems talk of is very moving. Yes. I mean, it's, it's not just love. I mean, it, I mean, it is. I mean, it is love, but it is 
filled with, with deep emotion. Yes. And the words can only hint at it. Mm. But that hint, when, when we understand, indicates that we know it too. Otherwise, we wouldn't, it wouldn't resound for us. Isn't it so? Yes. <clears throat> yes, in in um, in this course, in his talking with people, Sri Ramakrishna said, "There's ordinary devotion, and then there is." the kind of love that we're, that you just gestured to, Beverly, this, I've become crazed for this. <laughs> you know, uh, this supreme love, this, in Sanskrit, the word is prema, this love that, that goes beyond any ordinary human, Thing. And it's when the heart is fully open. Thank you, Beverly. I'm glad you said something. I get nervous. <laughs> well, you've done good. <laughs> Thank you. I wept once for three days because he would not touch me. All of the saints talk about this, how there's this occasional withdrawal of the presence. And there's a great saint in the Indian tradition, Chaitanya. Neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. And then this is this is what I meant by her vulnerability. She she confesses to this, having wept for three days because she couldn't feel his touch. For is it not a bride's right to know him? Yes. Somebody tell me what they think she means by, I have seen what I want in heaven's shop. Crazed I have become for this. I think it is the divineness, Brother Shankara. That's what I'm thinking. I have seen what I want in heaven's shop the bliss. It's just so interesting to me that she characterizes it as a shop. Yeah. You know, there's all this on display for us. Exactly, the bliss. And, and it's, it's, it's not just any shop, it's heaven's shop. It's heaven's shop. Which means we have access to, to uh, meditation. The only way is probably through, through prayer and meditation, yes. And devotion. These these Catholics, they didn't practice most of them, practice what we would call meditation. Mm -hmm. They practice prayer and contemplation, but it, it ends up in the same place. Mother Teresa 
So Mother Teresa once said that God is the friend of silence. That's what she said. I, I read it somewhere long back. Friend God, of silence? Silence. God is the friend of silence. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just to add a little here too, maybe she's drawing back on her experiences when she was a child, you know, at six years old and that, when she ah. was in heaven shop. And like, I don't know, maybe shop, like, I'm sure they didn't have candy stores and all that back then, but maybe the shop was, you know, from a, like a younger, um, thinking What a good child. insight, Heidi. I think heaven. you're absolutely right. Yeah. So, because she knew at an early age what she wanted to do. Yes, she did. <laughs> she would, when she was seven, she went and sat in the cave and, and Christ said, we'll, we'll have our wedding later and then took her home. <laughs> she was going to that cave for the rest of her darn life. Yeah. You no, know? I mean... I wasn't doing that at six or seven. I mean, <laughs> no, none of us were. Do you? No, I can I can say, with pretty safely, that none of us were. I'm but sure. If you look back at those years, you'll find that there were hints and allegations. There, if you look back, you will see that uh, there were there were things that let you know that uh, you were a little different than other people. And uh, otherwise- my, par my parents didn't go to church. Uh -huh. and, and from a very early age, I would find neighbors that did. And so I went to many, many different churches. Isn't that I strange? would get myself invited by other neighbor kids or even even uh, adults i would approach and go to their church with them how lovely beverly i think that's the very first time you've ever told me that i've known beverly since 1958 and i don't think you've ever told me that before that's lovely i really enjoyed it too I'm sure you did. Yeah, church, particularly if it was a, a sweet church where they didn't give you this hellfire and damnation business, it was a, it was a, it was a real refuge. As somebody pointed out, not the Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was somebody I was talking to earlier today was telling me about their experience with with Sunday school and how they couldn't stand it. I, I shared that experience. So my grandmother said, well, if you don't like Sunday school then you'll have to come and sit in the sanctuary with me. And uh, that's what we did and I loved it. So it's a little after nine o'clock. Shall we, shall we uh, start with this poem again next week or? Shall shall we uh, shall we uh, go on to the next one? No one will begrudge me. What do you think? I go think, on. Yeah, I think everybody said what they want to say about the other one. So we'll start next week with "No one will begrudge me." Yeah, that would be great. Well, this, this is a powerful poem. This is one of her sermon poems. It's really, really, <laughs> you can see how it starts. I talk about it sometimes with him, all the suffering in the world. So, any final thoughts? And loving words from anyone? She's very inspiring, Brother Shankara, her whole, even though she only lived 36 years, she, it's almost like she had the wisdom of 100 years, she, right from the day one. She, yes. Well, that's why she was named a doctor of the church. Exactly. 
She Thank had you. that healing presence. So glad we get to read all this wisdom, wisdom of these great mystics. Yeah, me too, Haima. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Brother Shankar. Well, thank you, dear. Anything else from anyone? Everyone should try to go dance tonight. <laughs> Truly. I'm going to read you something that, uh, that I wrote recently. This was written day before yesterday. No, Saturday. We share this dream of manyness. Let us enjoy the companionship. You know for whom the bell tolls. Hear it as my love for thee. We share this dream of manyness. Let us enjoy the companionship. You know for whom the bell tolls. Hear it as my love for thee. So, with that, may you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be cheerful. May you have peace of mind. May you go forward in the divine presence's loving and protective embrace. And anyone who speaks to June, uh, tell her we missed her tonight. <clears throat> Heidi, you're probably likely to speak to her before anybody else. I think Heidi's already gone. No, anyway. I think she's just stepped out, Brother Shankar. Her name is still there. Yeah. Stepped out. All right. So, um, for those of you who could capture it, uh, uh, Bart did post that link to uh, that uh, that near death experience that he found so moving. I intend to watch it right away. So. Uh, Good night, all you sweet people. And uh, until next Monday or the next time we see one another otherwise, um, we'll start with the poem, No One Will Begrudge Me. All right, any, any final thoughts from anyone? All right. No, just thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, Heidi, I don't know if you heard it, but uh, we missed June this evening. I'm yeah. sure there was some good reason for her not being here. Well, she has a big birthday coming up uh, Saturday, I think. And oh, really? So she may be just, she may be a busy, busy gal celebrating already, you know. So I she's, know. she's a Taurus too, is she that little uh, rascal? I think first, uh, <laughs> May 1st. Well, uh, I, I, I have to say I'm not surprised. Yeah. All right, dears. So. Well, when you when when and if you speak with her, give her our love and tell her we missed her. I surely will, and all my love to everybody here. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night. And Beverly, thanks for speaking up. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.